MRCC, thank you so much for being here to worship God with us mm -hmm. together digitally through the magic of the computer screen. We're excited about what God's doing this morning. Yes, we're so glad you're here. Thanks for taking the time to be a part of MRCC Online. Uh, we have a couple of announcements for you. If you are making an Operation Christmas Child box, uh, we'd love for you to make sure it's dropped off in the office by Wednesday. They're being taken off from there and that's the end of all of our collections. Again. So you can bring it to church on Sunday. You can even drive by on Sunday at any point. Uh, there's a spot where you can drop off or just drop it off in the office. Yeah. We celebrate really quick. We have given a lot of these boxes. Oh, yeah. We take care of a lot of these boxes. A lot of kids are getting presents. We sent out over 500 boxes. That's insane. I know. That's it's super amazing. amazing. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. While we're talking about the Christmas. Christmas. Oh, I love Christmas. <laughs> also, time. if you want to join us on November 21st, Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon, we are going to set up our annual Mount Rainier Christian Center Christmas lights display. It's going to be so cool. Um, Tons come of fun. Out. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have, we're gonna food. have donuts, food, donuts? lunch. It might be a little afternoon because we're gonna have to eat some pizza. Okay. And then uh, clean up a little bit. But yeah, it usually yeah. only takes a couple hours or, or cool. three or four, depending on how many people show up. So we need you if you could come, <laughs> bring your ladders, bring maybe some work gloves, and yeah. let's have some fun. Yeah, cool. should we worship God too? Let's worship let's, together. Let's worship together. Good morning, church. Father, we worship you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for your presence. You're so worthy, Lord. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Let's sing of his forgiveness, church. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Take me to the riverside, take me under, baptize, I need you, oh God, I need you, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, it's like the sound of a symphony to my Holy water on my 
forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah, you have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. Cloud by day is a sign that you are with me. The fire by night is the guiding light to my feet. You found me, you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, it's your the God, you're the God who fights for me, Lord. I You 
are here Moving in our midst I worship you, Lord I worship you, yes You are here Working in this place I worship you Worship as we worship, we declare who you are, Lord. You are playmaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. Yes, I worship you, Lord. You are here. stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop, you, never stop. you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is Yes, you are way maker, 
Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. As we stand before you, so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul on to you surrendered all I am is yours. We stand before your presence. Can we declare this church? As I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. And I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. Yes, all I am is yours, Lord. Yes, I'll stand with arms. For this family, Lord, how we thank you. Yes, God, we thank you for this family that you've adopted us into. You call us your own. You made a way. Father, what a time that we are in. What a time to trust all the more in your faithfulness, who you are. This forgiveness that we celebrate in songs like this that we sing today. God, you're the one we place our trust in. You're the one we place our hope in. Father, you never fail. We know that you are in this season. You are moving in this time. You are walking with us. You know our hurts. Let us not forget our faithful God. Let us remember time and time again how you've come through and that you are going to come through in a big way, even in the times when we doubt the most, because that's how good you are. That's how faithful you are. So we thank you. We stand with arms high, our hearts abandoned before you. All we are is yours. We offer up this praise to you. You're so worthy, Lord. And as your church, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. It's so good and so powerful to declare truths like this together, united as his sons and daughters. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Well, hello and welcome everyone. It is great to be with you again. I'm, I'm so glad that you have made it a priority to take the time to set aside in your life for worship and for listening to God's Word. You know, the Bible tells us that we can't think clearly, we can't think straight without worship. It is in worship that our hearts and minds and spirits are, are kind of rebooted, so to speak. And, and God meets us in those moments in deeper ways than we even know. So I'm so glad that you have gathered with us. I'm also excited that our, our technical team here at MRCC has been working very hard. And, and we hope in the next couple of weeks to be able to make the online experience uh, a live experience for you. We, we want to make sure it's not 
glitchy, that it works properly. So we're, we're engaged in some final testing, but we're looking forward to the moment that if you're gathering with us on a Sunday morning, you will be with us in the moment. Uh, those of us who are meeting live in person, uh, as well as those of us who are meeting online, we're very much uh, looking forward to that. There's something, something special about that. Right now, about half of our fellowship is online. About half of our fellowship meets in person, and we want to bring everyone together into that moment uh, as we look forward to the end of this whole COVID thing when we can be together in person. Great news we're hearing about vaccines and stuff. Excited about that. But uh, welcome today. This morning we're going to continue our journey in Philippians. We're actually going to finish our, our journey in Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 4. I invite you to grab your Bible and turn there uh, beginning uh, with verse 10 and uh, working down through the end uh, of the chapter. And, and remember, when we begin to take God's Word on its own terms, that's when we really begin to mature in Christ. When we allow God's Word to speak to us verse by verse, that's what we've been doing this fall. And uh, we're finishing in Philippians today. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 10. And, and uh, before we jump into God's Word, let me ask you a question this morning. And, and this is kind of an unusual question. Who, who is it in your life who believes in you? Who has it been in your life who believed in you? who expressed that belief in a way that it, it touched your heart? Who believes in you? M most of us have had someone, if we're fortunate, several someones who believed in us or who believe in us now. Do you remember what that felt like? How important that was to the inside of you? Do you remember how it lifted you, how it pulled you up beyond your own estimation of who you were or what you were capable of? Who believes in you? John Maxwell writes that we tend to become what the most important person in our life thinks we will become. That's how profound our effect on one another. There's a lot of truth in that statement. Our world constantly tells us to believe in ourselves. We hear that all the time, even as we know that's ultimately a road to nowhere. I, I read an article that said that the reason puns exist, the reason people enjoy puns is because of their, they have too much self-confidence. <laughs> they think they can make themselves laugh. And if the pun appeals to you, you might be one of those people who believes in yourself maybe a little bit too much. I think I might fall into that category, and so I collected a few new puns that I found this week. I thought I'd share them with you. Brace yourself. For example, if you put a picture of yourself in a locket and hang it around your neck, then you could claim to be independent. Yes, I just said that. <laughs> or, or how about this one? Imagine that you're a place where horses stay. Now you're mentally a stable. <laughs> I have no shame, too self-confident. Have you heard about the new do-it-yourself dental surgeries? Brace yourself. Yeah, with the whole COVID thing, now is not the time to surround yourself with positive people. Think about that. <laughs> Here's one that is just gonna lower your opinion of me all the way to the bottom. My fencing opponent stood shocked for a moment when I defeated him, and then he said, that was an amazing move. Did you come up with that all on your own? And I said, no, it was a repost. Yeah, puns are enjoyed by people who have a little too much belief in themselves. And believing in yourself can only get you so far because at the end of the day, you and me know ourselves too well. But when someone else believes in you, that can make all the difference. I remember many years ago, 30 years ago, when Rhonda and I were young ministers, youth pastors in a church where, uh, you know, there was a great uh, moral failure and tragedy on the part of the pastoral leadership. And, and uh, in all the hurt and chaos that followed that, there was a real sense that the church was going to cease to exist, that it was going to fail. And, and we were just very young in our mid-20s, uh, the youth pastors uh, on the church staff. And, and in the middle of that question of whether the church was going to survive, some folks in the church asked Rhonda and I to their home. 
And as we sat there in a circle praying about our church, they turned to us and said, Pastor Greg, we believe that you can lead us forward. We believe that you can bring us through this as a church. I can't tell you how much that moment mattered to me, to us, to Rhonda and I both. To feel the faith that these people had in us was tremendously uplifting. And it made all the difference in the next few years as, as God was gracious to lead all of us together as a church to recover from that experience, to grow, to move on. It's important when someone believes in you. And this morning, God wants you to know that He believes in you. I don't say that tritely. I don't say that lightly. We're going to hear Jesus call our attention to that in a little bit. But the Apostle Paul understood this. So he says something very significant as he finishes the letter to the Philippians. And we, we hear him say that in Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 10 and moving forward. So let's, let's work through this passage together and listen to what the Apostle is telling us. Listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to us. Philippians 4, beginning with verse 10, Paul says, as he turns to the end of his letter, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you, the Philippian believers, have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. He's referring to their support for him while he is in prison. And he's rejoicing in that support because he knows he's not alone. He knows there are people who care about him, people who believe in him, people who share his faith. We all need that. No less an authority on suffering than Mother Teresa said famously that no pain is greater than the pain of loneliness. Paul is saying that he doesn't feel that pain because he knows there are people who stand with him, who believe in him. Mother Teresa also said that the most precious gift we can give each other is attention, our attention. And Paul is feeling that and celebrating it. And, and maybe there's someone in your life right now that needs you to give them your attention. When you do, you lift them, you bless them. I want to invite you to accept that challenge. Maybe God's speaking to you about someone right now. But, but, but then Paul gets to the point of our message this morning, beginning with verse 11. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. In other words, he's not pleading with them for more. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Notice he says he's learned how to do that. I know what it is to be in need, Paul says, and I know what it is to have plenty. But I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed, or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. He says, I, I have learned how to be content whatever my circumstances. And then he finishes by saying, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Last week we talked about a, a peace that passes understanding. This is a confidence that can't be shaken. In fact, it's more than confidence. Paul uses a, a powerful emotional word, contentment. This is a contentment that can't be shaken. Paul is feeling it. He says, I've learned how to feeling it. He says, it comes to me through my relationship with God. And the truth of the matter is that God wants you to know how to feel that kind of contentment that kind of unshakable confidence. Paul is feeling it even though he's in prison. Think about that for a moment. Many of us have lots more privileges and blessings than he did, and we're not content. Paul, with all of his trials, is content. He has learned how to be content. Sometimes we get a little inkling of what he's talking about here just in, in everyday life. I remember when I worked in the emergency room and, and there were times when we as an emergency room crew would be exhausted and filthy and overwhelmed by the situations we were dealing with. But in the midst of being exhausted and filthy and overwhelmed, there was a kind of contentment that came with it. 
There was a feeling that we were doing something that mattered, something that mattered to other people, something that was good, and something that was significant. Sometimes every parent feels like that when the burdens of raising a child wear you down. At the same time, you're thinking, I wouldn't trade this for anything. The Apostle Paul is describing feeling like that, even in prison, because he's learned how to feel like that. It doesn't happen, friends, by by magic or by accident. It's something you learn from God. And Paul doesn't call it a, a secret because it's hidden. He calls it a secret because lots of people haven't learned it. And he says that secret has to do, verse 3, with him who gives me strength. Notice what he says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And by that, he doesn't mean, as you know, physical strength. He means strength of spirit, of heart, of mind. He's talking about the, the strength that helps you get up and face something that has to be done. Like for us men, the first time we have to change a baby's diaper, oh my goodness, what a challenge. Yet we step into it and we learn how to do it. Of course, you know that's harder for a guy to do than for a woman to do. Of course, you understand that I'm kidding. But it's a kind of strength that comes to the heart, to the mind, to the spirit that Paul is talking about. And it comes from God. How? How does it come from God? How has Paul learned that reality? Well, the the truth of the matter is that Paul understood in his soul that he had been chosen by God. And understanding that gave him strength. It elevated him despite his circumstances. I love to tell the story about how this works. My Uncle Paul, when he was in high school, uh, you know, went out for sports his freshman year, but, uh, you know, he just wasn't uh, very good at it. And the athletic director noticed his energy, his zeal, his desire, and said, hey, Paul, just pick one sport and focus on it. So over the course of that summer, he picked basketball. When he showed up the next year, the coach saw how hard he had worked all year. And he knew what that meant. And so he said to Paul, Paul, I want to tell you something. Right now, you're on the varsity. You're going to start every game. You're never going to come out unless you foul out. He chose Paul. He expressed a belief in him. And as a consequence, my uncle went on to become the all-time leading high school scorer in San Diego County. A big deal. But he'll tell you that, that it flowed from the confidence of being chosen, of being believed in. Paul knows that. He knows that God believes in him, that God has chosen him. And in the same way, God wants you to understand that if you've received Jesus as your Savior, he's chosen you. Because there is a strength of spirit, heart, and mind that comes from knowing that God believes in you. Paul says, I've learned to be content no matter what because of him who gives me strength. Jesus told a great story that illustrates this. But it's a story that lots of people don't like because they don't love grace as much as they love themselves. We're going to explore that in just a moment. When I was a new believer, a new Christian, this, this story confused me. But when I began to understand it, my Christian faith changed from a, from a duty, from a demand, to a passion, <laughs> to a love for God. Here's the story Jesus told. You can find it in Matthew chapter 20. Let's walk through it together in the next few minutes. Matthew chapter 20, beginning with verse 1, Jesus says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. And he agreed early in the morning to pay them a denarius, a day's wage in Roman times, for the day's work. And he, and he sent them out into his vineyard. So far in the story, so good. A fair wage, a mutually beneficial situation. Everybody wins. This is capitalism at its finest. Verse 3, Jesus goes on. About the third hour, this same landowner went out 
and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. Now the third hour would be about 9 a.m. in our terms. And he goes out and he finds some workers who weren't there earlier, who are there now, who were late to the job site, so to speak. He finds them doing nothing and he, he told them, he says, you also go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. That, that detail's significant. So they went. Understand, again, nothing unusual is happening here. This gang that's hanging around at nine in the morning looking for work is a, a less meritorious bunch than the ones who were there earlier. These aren't the early birds that get the worm, but you know, they're there, they're looking for work. He chooses them. The story goes on, verse five. He went out again about the sixth hour. That's noon. And then again about the ninth hour. Now we're talking three in the afternoon. Most of the workday is gone. And he did the same thing. He found men lingering and loitering and he hired them and he sent them to work in his vineyard with a promise to pay them whatever is right. Now realize by three in the afternoon, the talent pool has gotten thin and weak. We're way beyond the A team now. But the landowner still isn't finished seeking. He's still searching for people to hire for people to bless, for people to invite into his work. You know, I, I want to be more like that. Everyone who knows God wants to be more like that. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many influential, not many of noble birth. In other words, you weren't the cream of the crop. That's so true of me. But God, Paul says, chose the weak things of the world. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before him. This landowner is, is living that out in Jesus' story in a practical way. He's continuing to call the least into his blessing. Dear friends, let us remember that our salvation is not a reward. It is a gift given in redeeming love. Not many of us were the early birds, the type A's, the, the high achievers, and yet God came seeking us right where we were, in whatever messes we had made for ourselves, in the shadow of whatever opportunities we had missed or failed at. He comes seeking us. Our salvation is not a reward. It is a gift given in redeeming love. That's part of what Jesus is, is making clear here. Once again, when I think of, of those folks who, who, who chose us to become their pastor all those years ago, I was filled with amazement at their faith in me. In the same way, God knows more about your potential than you do. And he's in the business of choosing you, even though in your life it may be three in the afternoon, even though at your life it may be noon and you slept in and missed where you should have been. He's still seeking you. That's the point of Jesus' story. And he's not done yet. The scripture goes on, verses six and seven. Jesus says about the 11th hour, an hour before the end of the workday in those days, he, the landowner, went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? And they said, well, no one has hired us, kind of a lame answer. The landowner's been going to the, the place of hiring all day long. <laughs> no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, well, I will. I want you. I choose you. Go and work in my vineyard. Now here, friends, is where that simple capitalist formula starts to break down. According to the law of you get what you deserve, these fellows have fallen far short. They are the bottom of the barrel. But the master hires them anyway. Why? Because he's full of grace. Because that's who he is. Because that's his heart. That's his nature. That's his desire. He chooses the lowly and despised things. He chooses you and me and elevates us. 
He makes us his sons and daughters. In the story, he invites them into his, his family business. The, the idea is the same. He chooses us. Why? Because he is full of grace. You remember what grace is, right? The Greek word means unmerited favor. The guys who've missed 11 of a 12-hour workday, 11 hours, you know, they don't deserve much. Yet, God chooses them still. Grace describes something which isn't deserved, isn't earned, isn't fair. And yet, it's the heart of God. Let me ask you today, when was the last time you gave that kind of grace to someone? Lots of people love fair more than they love God, and it makes them into liars about him. I love the old story about the pastor who saw three boys arguing on the sidewalk after church over a stray dog. And seeing the intensity of their arguing, he intervened and asked them what they were doing. The boys said, we're having a contest to see who gets this dog. The one who tells the best lie wins. The pastor was upset with this. He said, boys, when I was your age, I was taught not to lie, and I learned not to lie, and I haven't lied in more than 50 years. The boys were quiet for a moment, and then one of them said, okay, pastor, you win. <laughs> yeah, when we love fair more than we love God, we become liars about God, because his gospel is about his grace. And in this story, Jesus is telling the truth about God, that he loves lost causes, that he believes in them enough to hire them, to make them his own, to choose them. He believes in failed people, in people who haven't done what they should, who haven't been what they could have been, who've blown their chances. Ask Matthew, a tax collector who Jesus called to become a disciple right in the middle of his life of crime. Ask Peter, who thought much of himself and then found himself to have fallen far short of his belief in himself, who betrayed Jesus to his face with an oath, and yet the Lord chose him, called him back, said, I still want you, I still choose you. Ask that woman caught in the act of adultery, of betraying at least one marriage, if not two. And yet, Jesus still invites her to come and follow him. You see, that's the heart of God. That's the gospel of grace. That's why Jesus is telling this story, because God chooses, God believes in people like you and me. And in the story, Jesus goes even further. Look at verses 9 and following. The scripture says, When evening came, the owner of the vineyard called his foreman, and he said, Call all the workers so I can pay them their wages. And, and I want you to begin with the last ones hired, the ones at the 11th hour, and then we'll work our way back through the day to those who were hired first in the morning. And so the workers who were hired about the 11th hour came, and each received a denarius, a full day's wage. They'd only worked an hour, but God gives them a full day's wage. Seeing this, the scripture said, when those came who were hired first, they expected to be received, they expected to receive more. But each of them received a denarius, a day's wage. And in the story, Jesus says, when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Despite the fact they had agreed at the beginning of the day to work the day for a day's wages, they began to grumble against the landowner. When we hear Jesus tell this story, we have a choice to make. We can grumble as well. Or we can celebrate what the landowner is doing. It all comes down to whether we believe in ourselves or believe in God's grace. Lots of people believe in Jesus, but they don't believe Jesus. And when he tells a story like this, they essentially plug their ears and harden their hearts and say, I don't want to go there. And you can tell the difference between people by how they react to this story of grace. 
Jesus asks the grumbler's appointed question. He says, are you envious because I am generous? And the short answer for them is yes. That's what it boils down to. They're upset because he was generous. But here's what Jesus was teaching by telling this story, friends. He was saying, God wants you if you've fallen behind, if you've failed to measure up, if you've missed or wasted your chances. He is still inviting you to come and join him. He still seeks you. He still wants you. He still chooses you. And when you know that, you have the kind of strength Paul was describing. When Paul says, I, 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 I can do everything through him who gives me strength, he's talking about this story. He's talking about this awareness, this understanding of God's choosing. The landowner in this story knows that his belief in these men has a kind of power, a power they need, and he seeks to lift them by it because that's who God is. And that's what God wants to do in your life. The only question is whether you're going to respond to his choosing. That's all you have to do. When he invites you to go and work in his field, whether it's noon or the third hour or the sixth hour or the eleventh hour, whenever it is, you receive his belief, you receive his choosing, and you go into his field. That's who God is. That's Jesus' point. That's what Paul understands, which is why he has a strength, which is why he has a contentment regardless of circumstances. Brian Chappelle tells about a woodworking project he did in middle school. He took the end of a log that he thought as a middle schooler looked a little bit like a horse's head and he attached some two by fours and a rope tail and he added some nails and he, he gave it to his dad for Father's Day. His dad said, thanks son, it's wonderful. What is it? <laughs> like a lot of parents do with craft and arts projects. Brian explained to him, he said, Dad, it's a tie rack. You hang your tie on the nails. You can hang all your ties on the nails. So his dad took the, the tie rack and leaned it against the wall in the closet because the legs didn't work and it wouldn't stand on its own. And for years, he used it as his tie rack. Brian writes, as an adult, when I gave it to him, I thought it was awesome. As I grew up, I realized it was awful. But I also began to understand that my dad received it and used it, not because it was awesome, but because he loved me and he believed in me. Church, Jesus is telling us that's who God is. That's who the Father is. Jesus is telling this story so that we will know that, so that we will understand that, so that we will choose to respond to his choosing, no matter how late in our day it is. You see, the secret of being content is knowing that God wants you, that he chooses you, and that you can try again, no matter how many times you've failed. Because you see, friends, and we're almost done, for a father, the point is never comparing kids. It's raising them. People who are always comparing themselves to other people will never know the strength that Paul has that makes him content in prison because they're trying to believe in themselves instead of looking at a Father God and his belief in them because they're too busy comparing themselves to everyone around them. Verse 12 of Matthew chapter 20 in Jesus' story the men, the grumblers say, these men worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. In other words, they were comparing themselves. We're better than those people. I wonder who it is that you feel the same way about. That you say, well, I'm better than those people. God wants you to understand that his grace goes far beyond your comparing not only for their sake, but for your sake. Because belief in yourself is a road to nowhere, but knowing God believes in you, that's the road to the Father's heart. The phrase in verse 12, made them equal, betrays that these early birds felt superior to the latecomers. In fact, their whole identity was wrapped up in feeling superior. How much of your life is devoted to maintaining a false sense of superiority? 
God operates on a different track because he's a father, not an employer. So, so he says to the early birds, verses 13 to 15 of Jesus' story, he says to them, take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Boy, there's a question to pierce the heart. There's a question to test my heart, to test your heart. Are you envious because he's generous? God wants us to understand his heart for them so that we will feel his heart for us. That's why Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why in prison he said, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He knew he was chosen. And through that came his strength. Jesus wants you and me to learn that we are chosen by grace. And that's why he ends his story with a, a coda, so to speak, in verse 16. He says, so the last will be first and the first will be last. In other words, some people are going to spend their entire lives comparing and trying to get ahead in the comparison. And as a result, they're going to end up in last place forever. But others will stop comparing and start to understand that life is about redeeming people, that that is the heart of God, that when we choose to give our belief in others to them, we lift them, we invite them to respond just as God does. Let me ask you, who will you choose to believe in? Not because they deserve it, but because you know the power of gracious choosing. Paul knows that power, which is why he says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's what he writes as he closes his letter to the Philippians. He says, I'm good here. It doesn't matter the circumstances. I've learned how to be content, and I know where my strength comes from. And so I can overcome in any and every circumstance. God wants you to feel that. Because what grows out of your understanding of his choosing is the strength that you need. Now, I remember many years ago when Isaiah was a boy and, and we were, uh, uh, it was time for him as, as a Royal Ranger, kind of a, a Christian Cub Scout organization, it was time for, for us to do what's called the Pinewood Derby, where we build these little cars and race them. And, and I, I, I wasn't good at that kind of thing. I'd never been great at that kind of thing. Some of the guys in the church, though, they were old hands and experts at this. And, and I thought to myself, gosh, you know, Isaiah's car is going to race these other cars. You know, maybe it would be better if, you know, another dad helped him build and design his car. But you know what Isaiah said? <laughs> he said, no, dad, I want to do it with you. So, so we built our Pinewood Derby car and I searched the internet and tried every trick I could read about or come up with. I listened to other guys. I did my best to help Isaiah. We built a little 57 Chevy Pinewood Derby car. Thought it looked great. But you know that Pinewood Derby car lost every single race it was entered in. <laughs> it didn't win a single race. It was dead last of all the cars. And yet, to this day, it is one of my most precious memories of when Isaiah was growing up because he wanted to do it with dad, no matter what. In the same way, God chooses you and he wants you to know him as the one who chooses you. That happens when you receive Jesus Christ as your savior. You know, the gospel is simple. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, to as many as received him, to those who believed in him, he, Jesus, gave the right to become children of God. God chooses you. Will you respond to his choosing? Maybe it's the, the ninth hour, the sixth hour, the eleventh hour for you. It's not too late. God is inviting you to come and be his. Will you respond to him? If you do, you will know the secret of contentment and you will discover his strength that enables you to overcome everywhere. Let, let's pray together. Would you bow your heads? Father God, we thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you for telling us this story. Paul, we thank you for your heart <laughs> in expressing your contentment, how you learned it from a Father God. And Lord, we pray 
that you would help us to understand that you choose us and that when we respond to you in our choosing, then it doesn't matter if it's the 11th hour or the sixth hour. When we come to you, you bless us because we've responded to your choosing. God, we pray, send us out into our world as people who believe in others by grace, that they might be redeemed and drawn up into your love. We pray for that. God, send us out as people who know how to be content and who know where our strength comes from. We pray for that. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for spending this time with us, friends. We're going to start on a new journey when we get together again. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them.